everybody. Um, my name is Erin Fetzer. I'm actually, uh, I'm Rob and Kathy, uh, their daughter. I'm, uh, Comanche is a very important force to me growing up. One, he's a huge part of American history, but also I'm currently stationed at Fort Riley as an Army captain. And so Comanche's last living years spent, were spent at Fort Riley in the service of the United States Army. Um, so holds a very dear place in my heart. But uh, before we introduce our speaker today, I want you to remind you of the little tickets that you got when you came in here. So just make sure you keep your number in mind because you might win something real nice. Um, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Rob Kornacki. So he, a little bit about him. He's an avid horseman, hunter, nearly you know, 20, 30 years of fox hunting experience, hunting experience, retired armor officer, um, got to the rank of lieutenant colonel, 20 plus years of service there. So also an avid historian and has a great interest in American history and the history of Comanche. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Rob Kornacki. Thanks, Aaron. Aaron is also going to serve as my person to keep me from going down rabbit holes because when we start talking about Comanche, there are a lot of rabbit holes and sidebars. As I'd like to tell you, he was a great dressage horse, but he wasn't. Comanche was a war horse. That was his purpose. That's why he was purchased by the United States Army, and that was his duty for all his period of active duty. And this was a rough war. In fact, these wars went on an awful long time. He met his final active duty status at the Little Bighorn in southern Montana, June 25th. 1876, shot or arrowed, depending on whose truth you believe, between uh, five and six times, and yet brought back to hell. Pretty wild place. If you remember, I was just talking to this lady over there who's walked a little big horn as I have. You know, very harsh ground, very difficult to get any kind of cover if you're encountering overwhelming odds, and they certainly did that particular day. This was the gentleman in charge. Now we could go on for the next three days talking about the merits or the demerits of George Armstrong Custer. I would tell you in my humble opinion, what I've been studying for the last 55 years as an adult, he was a good guy to get you on the wall of the uh, Memorial Chapel at Fort Leavenworth, which coincidentally was finished in 1877. And you'll see several of the officers and men plaques dedicated to that on that wall. But you say, but wait, it's about the horse Comanche. I knew all about Comanche, about a 10 year old. On the right is Sal Minio. He's a good old Italian boy from the Bronx. Well, he played the Indian that was the owner of Tonka. Well, Tonka became Comanche. And then after Comanche left active service, he went back to Sal Minio. So that's, that's all you need to know. And then there was Robert Shaw. If, you, if, you're, if you're old like me, you'll know Robert Shaw. Well, he was George Armstrong Custer here. He was also the nemesis of James Bond in a picture or two. And perhaps his most famous role was Jaws. He was the captain of the, whatever, the native ah. of the Santa Maria. And this looks pretty civilized. I mean, we know Custer was killed. I didn't know there was a white horse out there. Now, the only thing I can figure is that the Lone Ranger had to use, get some extra dough so we could pass that horse out there for some extra work. And it looked pretty civilized. I mean, everybody's dead lying on the ground and Custer's there. And okay, I'll buy that. Which brings us to the true or false element of all this history. You know, what can you believe? What can't you believe? If 150 years ago somebody said, it's like this, Comanche was a Morgan. Well, 100 years after that, it turns into gospel. Comanche was a Morgan. Do we know what kind of horse Comanche was? Not a prayer. They've never done any, you know what they call that? Gen you know, genetic tracing. Genetic yeah. tracing. We only know that about 11,000 years ago, there were no more horses in North America. The Spanish brought them in the 16 or so hundreds. And I would assume that Comanche was a horse that was evolved or brought from those early Spanish horses. This is a very learned woman. In fact, I, I count my blessings. I was able to at least talk to her a time or two on the phone. Her name was Elizabeth Atwood Lawrence. I don't know if anybody in the country has ever done any more research on Comanche than her. But what she says is absolutely true. 
complete review of known facts would make this about a three minute presentation. There's an awful lot we think we know, but is it true? We, we can debate that a bit. Three great sources. Her book, Elizabeth Atwood Lawrence, His Very Silent Speaks. I've given away a couple copies of this. In fact, I went to find mine to bring you here today and uh, never did come back. Lou DeMarco, who's on the staff, also retired, armor guy, wrote a very good book on War Horse. And then perhaps the best nonfiction book I've ever read is Gwyn's Empire of the Summer Moon. You want to know how it was during the period of Comanche domination of the Western Plains, Gwyn hits it on the head. He was nominated for the Pulitzer Prize and he didn't win. Why didn't he win? Robert's assumption he told it too straight. You know, it wasn't, we're going to put in the poor cavalrymen at the mercy of the Indians or the poor Indians at the mercy of cavalrymen. He told a very straight story, and I think that impacted upon his not winning the Pulitzer Prize. So our question is, was it this nonstop encroachment? And was there nonstop encroachment? Yes, there was. But again, History is very, very selective sometimes, very subjective. And I'll give you a great example of that. Everybody's heard of the Trail of Tears, We're going back a little. In 1830, the Jackson administration, Andrew Jackson administration, passed the Indian Relocation Act. And they took the five civilized tribes, some of whom, like the Cherokees, were confederated, and they moved them out to the Western Horse Tribes area. And they walked them out there. The Trail of Tears, awful thing to do. You can't give the government anything positive about that. But did you know that among those Cherokees on that awful walk were 1,800, approximately, of their black slaves? I so said, what? Well, this, in fact, is a very good Smithsonian Institution source that talks about that fact, adding a little bit of question to, you know, have we been a little bit revisionist in our history? It doesn't make the Trail of Tears right, wrong, but it just adds another wrinkle that in these very troubling times, many, many people had slaves. Indians certainly enslaved other Indians. Why did we end up with the Crow people helping us in the Western fight against the Sioux and the Kiowas and the Cheyenne? Well, because they were bitter enemies of those other Indian tribes had been subjugated. If you go to Little Bighorn right now, it's on the Crow Reservation. My, my. You know, how did that happen? Well, they were on the, the winning side of that particular war. The Indian Wars. Maybe not, this is my opinion, but if you look at the Indian Wars, they were going on a long time. The first people to settle in this country, I think, was Jamestown in about 1607. You start before that, in that period, there's never been a period that I can find where there hasn't been conflict between white European settlers and Indian tribes, whether it's in the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, and going farther west. Now, how is it interpreted? Kevin Costner, I, I saw that movie, those two evil guys, and I saw how you treated Kevin Costner, and he was one of yours. Again, for the benefit, maybe not quite as slanted as my Tonka movie, but again, did it tell an accurate historical account? I question that. Let me tell you a guy whose opinion I do request, or do appreciate. Medal of Honor winner from the Spanish-American War. Got his Medal of Honor about a hundred years after he passed, okay? Teddy Roosevelt. You read what he says here. Long series of outrages on both sides. But the claim to the land, you know, who last possessed the land seems to have claim to it. Now I would tell you, this is Roosevelt's opinion, but it seems to be accurate. For the same ways that Indian tribes were displaced and replaced by other stronger Indian nations. And so the continuum. Now that brings us to here we go. Who's going to get the? Who's going to get the mission? Well, of course, the United States Army. Why not? Give them the mission of subjugating these Plains Indian tribes, so that we can get control, put them on reservations, and make them more conducive to our particular view of how they should be acting. 
And what was the problem with all this? Oh, the poor horses. I mean, they had it. They had it hard. Remington. Remington knew horses, and he certainly summed it up very well. No one cares. No one much notices. But you all care because we're all people who are interested in the welfare, the continuing of horse activities and riding and such associated things of great benefit. A lot of great opportunities the United States Army has over the years. These gentlemen can testify right now that we're keeping that alive. Maybe by hanging by a thread sometimes, but the ability to demonstrate our historical relevance and the use of the horse in the United States Army is still with us. Is Comanche the most famous horse <coughs> in military history? Good question. This becomes in the, in the realm of uh, you know, opinion. How about a couple of contenders? I remember this horse. I still remember the drumbeat for Kennedy's funeral. Blackjack. You know, a ceremonial horse, but put him in the midst of thousands of people upon a parade route, and steady and very, very, very noble animal. Little Sorrel. Who was, who was Little Sorrel's rider here? Stonewall Jackson. Unfortunately, Jackson was well ahead of his Confederate position during the beginning of a battle, and he was shot and killed by his own soldiers, accidentally. And I'm not sure what happened to Little Sorrel. Vicar Dandy. Now, a lot of people associate Comanche owned by Custer. I hate to say it, but Custer was pretty much of an elitist guy. I remember seeing a picture in his living room, or the equivalent, where he's sitting here and his wife's sitting there, he's reading something, and above his head are two pictures. One is of General Philip Sheridan, and the other one is of Brevet Major General George Custer. About two years out of the military academy at West Point as a second lieutenant, and he's then a major general. And he certainly appreciated that fact. What we don't know, you get a lot of brain with a little bighorn tossed to Marcus Reno who's attacking the Indian village from the south to north failed. How many people know that Reno was a brevet or a temporary one-star general during the Civil War? And I don't see any pictures of Reno standing looking very grand in his general officer uniform. Benteen, who gets a lot of discredit by not coming fast enough, pending P.S. Bring Pax, hurry, written by Custer's Edge. Benteen, after the Little Big Horn, was breveted a one-star general. I've never seen any pictures of Brentine wearing all this. To my point, Custer's not going to ride a horse like Comanche. These are thoroughbreds, Dandy and Vic. Dandy, he rode to the crow's nest. His scouts were going to show him the Indian village down there. Couldn't see anything. This was before everybody had good, you know, glasses and all that. He then switched to Vic and rode Vic into the battle. Whatever happened to Vic? Some people swear that they saw Vic lying dead on the Little Bighorn battlefield on Last Stand Hill. Others say no, he went with the Sioux north into Canada and was seen up there. What happened to Vic? Nobody knows. What happened to Dandy? That I know. He went up to Michigan and was claimed by Custer's father and written on occasions and parades and other ceremonial activities like that. Nelson or Blueskin? George Washington. Blueskin may have been the better looking horse, but when Washington needed a steady horse, he rode Nelson. What does history tell us about Nelson? Great horse in battle. Blueskin, supposedly ridden by Washington to the day before his death in 1799. I'm thinking, wait a second, the revolution is 1775, 76, and he's riding that thing to the day before his death. That, that horse either got to really, really old age or somebody misinterpreted who he was really riding, but a big gray horse. <coughs> Traveler. I think Traveler was taxidermied and ended up maybe in the area of Washington and Lee University, because Bobby Lee was, was his owner. Winchester. Philip Sheridan, Battle of Winchester. We're losing it. And Sheridan comes riding to the front, rallies his troops, and wins the battle, and the horse is renamed. Winchester. The Aaron, what was his original name? Oh gosh. <laughs> yeah, so we had a horse, we named it. Rienzi. Rienzi. So Sorry. Rienzi became Winchester. Getting a little closer to home, Chief. Renowned to be one of the, if not the last U.S. cavalry horse at Fort Riley. Okay? 
pretty, pretty famous horse. Sergeant Reckless, United States Marine horse, carrying munitions to troops on the front lines fighting, and did this oftentimes unassisted. Several monuments to Sergeant Reckless have all been, already been erected by the Marine Corps. I would tell you, you know how many monuments there are to Comanche? It's a very round number. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. Okay, we're going to go on the other side, the opposing force, but again, Americans, nevertheless. Who owned a horse named Blackie? He probably had 200 other horses, but he had a horse named Blackie, and his name was Sitting Bull. Now, he was at the Little Bighorn, but he wasn't a combatant. He was getting a little long in the tooth, a little old. <clears throat> he probably stayed in the general area of the village, and he did not participate in the fight. But reputedly, I've read this in several sources, had a horse that he named Blackie. Now, maybe something was lost in the translation from the Sioux language, but I'm just telling you, it seems to be pretty verifiable. And it shows how we always have, it seems, one step in the past and one step in the future. The top left picture is a Kirk Sternweiss painting of the last minutes on Last Stand Hill. It's one of the best I've ever seen. And yet there's Buffalo Bill, William Cody, and he made a lot of money even overseas, speaking of the Indian Wars and the cavalrymen and the horses roll and all of this. He even got Sitting Bull to participate. Hired him and he would have to ride around the arena one time and that was it. He would sell his autographs in uh, ancillary areas. Got tired of it. I would tell you, I'd like to say Sitting Bull had a great end, but he wasn't. He was not dealt with fairly at the end. Actually killed by his own people under the employ of the United States Army trying to take him into custody. Some common themes with these horses. Yeah, maybe. You know, I, I wouldn't say don't put too much stock in any of these. They didn't have to be terribly so sort of sound certainty to help. If you're going to go an awful long ways, hope that horse will not break down. And stop. Well, when Reno attacked the village, he quickly realized before he got within 300 yards of the southern end, this is a big mistake. If you've ever ridden and shot a handgun off a horse, well, you got a six-shooter. Try reloading that thing. You're carrying 24 rounds, and you're going over broken ground attacking a southern limit of an Indian village that has perhaps as many as 12 to 15,000 people with as many as perhaps 2,500 warriors. He dismounted, and that it led to the end of Reno and his disjointed retreat across the Little Bighorn River back up on the heights. Maybe if they had sabers, maybe he wouldn't have lost that initiative. But Custer said, leave those sabers behind. The Powder River Depot on the way to Little Bighorn, they all turned in their sabers, except for one officer, Lieutenant DeRudio. And what was the purpose of turning in sabers? I don't know, a little quieter. Maybe you could sneak up there a little bit faster. And I think really important, which Comanche was stout-hearted. I'm gonna show you uh, picture of what stout-hearted means in my opinion. These are stout-hearted horses. <laughs> if you look at the horses, they're, you know, well, and there's no barrier between this bull elephant. A friend of mine will hopefully be here next year to present his experiences in riding in Kenya. Took this picture. You see the gentleman on the right, he's got his reins about this far apart. He doesn't have his heels on, that's for damn sure. He's looking for the door. I, I can't blame him. That elephant could cover that distance where it's so inclined. And then the, the mission is to truly stay on that horse. They never got this place. But talk about a mix. This picture was taken five years ago. The mix of the old antagonisms and the new. Tristan Vorpui is the gentleman who owns this particular riding safari on the left. Several weeks, months after this picture was taken, he had a fire in one of his lodges where his visitors would stay. He rode, perhaps on this horse, and was shot and killed by automatic weapons fire. Why? I don't know, maybe a tribute back to Kenya was used by the British as a colony. Maybe old antagonisms, we don't have any area to graze our horses and we're going to take it out on this guy, that should be safe. But shot and killed, and his, his killers have never, never come to justice. Common theme, famous masters. And Comanche, well-remembered, because of who owned them? 
Who owned Comanche? Keo. Okay. Miles Keo, one of the company commanders of the seventh. Absolutely right. Very good. Truly a soldier of fortune. Came to the United States in about 1860 or 61, just in time for the Civil War. Became pretty important in the Civil War as a notable, fearless, you know, combat person in that particular war. Before that, it fought for the papacy in, you know, wars in the vicinity of Rome and such. So he had a lot of experience. He was kind of a soldier of fortune, if you will. This is him sitting on the steps of Custer's home at Fort Abraham Lincoln, which is in the present state of very southern North Dakota. Purchased by 90 bucks. It doesn't sound like a lot, but that's a lot of dough back then. Private making 60, $16 in that period of 1868. And remounts were always needed. You look at the carnage of the Civil War prior to the Indian Wars, you can transpose into the Indian Wars and beyond. One and a half million horses killed in the Civil War. That's probably a conservative estimate. I've read somewhere where as many as 40% of all the horses in North America were killed as a result of these wars, including Civil Wars, Indian Wars, etc. So it was hard on horses. When I was a kid, I used to watch the Lone Ranger and Tonto. They'd run into battle, or there was other movies. And everybody's always getting shot out of horses, but very seldom, aside from a horse hitting the ground, were there ever horses shot. I'm telling you, the guy on that horse is a heck of a lot smaller target than that horse is, period. And if you can put that person on the ground, a lot better chance of neutralizing them. So one heck of a lot of horses have been killed in service of the country. Remounts? Oh, this is pie in the sky. What did the Army settle for? What they could get. What they could get. And you know, we know all about conservation. I have to have the withers. We'd like to have them at, you know, 15 hands or better. We know Comanche was about 15-1, about 900 pounds in the accounts I've read. But nevertheless, his lot in life was a difficult one. From Fort Abraham Lincoln to the Little Bighorn was approximately 450 miles, and Custer wanted to get there quickly, because he did everything in his power to get there quickly. These horses didn't have a lot of time for grazing or being fed. They were ridden hard all the way to the Little Bighorn. With the combat trains, there was a company that would accompany the combat trains. This is where the mules were with the ammunition, the horse feed, etc. And that company would let the trains get a half a mile ahead of them and then let the horses feed and then get a half a mile behind them and continue that process replaced by another company. But there wasn't a lot of time given for the care and maintenance of horses. And if you look, in addition to the rider, 80 and 90 pounds, that's a lot of, a lot of weight and a lot of work going a long, long ways. Challenging terrain, multiple river crossings to be certain. But Comanche was also up to the task. Not only was a great stout horse, but he was fortunate he was one of the company commander's horses. Most of the company commanders, if not all, had at least two. Just like Custer switching from Dandy to Vic. So they always had horses that were a little more in better shape than the folks who were in the column that didn't have the opportunity to switch mounts. Point to ponder, Gaul, some 10 years after the battle, Gaul being one of the principles, Indian principles of the Battle of Little Bighorn. Can you imagine this? You've got this melee going on. Screaming, yelling, weapons being fired, you know, men screaming. And these seven cavalry horses were grazing because they were famished. It tells you the mistake trying to drive these horses and these men to get there ahead of everybody else. And I'll explain a little bit of how that battle evolved with brevity the purpose. Did the Indians care for the horses? Ah, no doubt. One of my greatest couple thrills of my riding experience is riding with my Navajo buddy here, Joe, the Indian name, with the Pittsburgh Steelers hat in Canyon de Chez. Now Canyon de Chez was the last outpost sanctuary of the Navajo in northeastern Arizona. And it's a canyon that is perhaps its walls are about this far apart as this room. And by the time you get five or 10 miles in, you have 1,200 vertical mile walls. And it goes for 70 miles. Hard place to uh, you know, enjoy successful combat with the Navajos. 
And this was before the Navajos were what we consider, oh, you know, very, very peaceful herders, etc. Now they're right up there with the Comanches and Kiowas in terms of raiders. Perhaps the Mexicans suffered more than the people in that particular area, but they were certainly equal opportunity employers along the Kiowa, Apache, Cheyenne, Sioux. But did they care for the horses? They, they would have had a, a six horse trailer, they brought these horses and they, they took 12 horses out of it. Yeah. And I asked Kathy, what kind of riders do you think the Navajos were? Well, they don't have to be riders anymore, they're business people. And they were okay, right? But you know, they didn't invent the name horse route. They were very adequate riders. They used the horse's tools as they had always. And they had hundreds and hundreds of horses. They estimate the pony herd that was with the, the Sioux and the many other tribes at the Little Bighorn estimates were as many as 15,000 animals. I mean, you didn't stay there long before that grass was depleted. Where did Comanche come from? Well, certainly from St. Louis, because that's where the Army, where was in the acquisition branch, that's where they purchased these 41 horses from. Before that, I've read where Comanche was up there in the Dakotas, and I'm not quite sure, but I think more likely than not, the Oklahoma and Texas area, and then brought to St. Louis, and then broke to a degree, gelded for sure in the case of uh, Stallions, the army didn't want stallions, and sent by rail to Fort Leavenworth. And that's why I think Kansas claims Comanche as certainly a, an honored entity in the state's history. That's where he began his military service, along with 40 other mounts. And then they were sent by rail to Ellis. Ellis is a little farther out here, right? I know that's where they close the interstate all the time when the weather gets bad. Who picked up Comanche? This gentleman. Thomas Custer, one of his brother's company commanders, died not far from his brother at the Little Bighorn. And if you ever wonder why there was retribution on both sides, terrible retribution, they only identified Thomas Custer by a tattoo he had on his arm. When I read the accounts, read it, his head was smashed to the width of a man's hand. So there wasn't a whole lot of quarter given. In my experience in combat, if you had a combat operation that caused 30% deaths, you probably had pushing 70% wounded, maybe dying, but wounded. Now, there were no survivors, so you know that 70% or so at the Little Bighorn that weren't killed outright met an awful fate thereafter. Again, why did they take no quarter at times? And, well, you know, I, can, I, I don't justify it, but I can understand the mindset. I visit these graves about it once every six months just to get, you know, just to get a feel. There are four graves in a line: Custer, Calhoun, Smith, and Yates. Four of the four company commanders at the Little Bighorn, reburied at Fort Leavenworth a year after the Little Bighorn. Now, who's buried in these graves? Hard to tell. You see this crowd. Hard to tell who's buried. There was five company commanders buried there, and in the in the process of showing respect and the rifle salute, the three rounds, they actually used actual all live ammunition. And the officer that was in charge of things, well, it ain't over. It ain't over. So I'm going to shoot blanks. This is, this is not over. And again, it, it wasn't over. And again, the fifth officer, Lieutenant McIntosh, he's not there anymore. Well, his wife had him disinterred in 1909, and he was moved to Arlington. Okay, so now there remains the four, gra four graves. McIntosh wasn't with Custer last that hill. The other four were. McIntosh died with Reno in the valley, the abortive attack to the southern end of the village. Where did Comanche serve? He was all over the place. And this is, this is verifiable. Again, how did he get all these places? Certainly most of the time by rail. I found it interesting that period, 1871 to 73, trying to get the Ku Klux Klan under control. You had the Civil War and the emancipation of slaves earlier in the 13th Amendment, all men are created equal. Well, not quite in the South and not for many, 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 many years. Did we poke, we, the United States Army, the government, poke our hands? 1868 granted the Sioux control of Black Hills in perpetuity, forevermore. Well, in 1873, 
George Custer, elements of the 7th Cavalry, had a sortie into the Black Hills for the purpose of surveying for a railroad that was supposed to go in. I don't think it ever got done. He was back in 1874, and it was kind of a grand walking trip for Custer. Shoot a, shoot a nice bull elk, get a nice grizzly. And again, there was, uh, there was some confrontations with Indians on a very small scale. But it seemed to me to be kind of a violation of that 1868 Laramie Treaty where that land was supposedly ceded to the Sioux. So they didn't do any, make any friends of the United States Army incursion. And then on to Fort Abraham Lincoln in southern North Dakota. And this is from whence Comanche began his last march. And again, where they could by train. From Fort Abraham Lincoln to the Little Bighorn, there wasn't any train. It was 450 miles riding on that horse. Some of the Lord, why was he named Comanche? Miles Keogh, you know, the first time he paid for this horse, got this horse, when he didn't name it? Because some of the accounts I've read said, well, he was on his campaign in uh, the area of Fort Dodge, Kansas, and struck by an arrow, and he screamed like a Comanche. So what was his name before that? Bugsy? I, I think I think Keogh named him Comanche from the very get-go. But you won't find anything in history to verify that. But all we know for sure, his name was Comanche. Was he the sole survivor? Custer had five companies with him. So the 7th Cavalry had 12. Five went with Custer on a swing to the east. Three went with Reno into the village. Three went with Benteen on a very unsuccessful, don't let him escape to the south. So it was five companies that died with, with Custer. Did he stay with his master until the end? Or was he a sole survivor? No, there was a lot of horses that were not dead, and there was a lot of horses that were half injured or dying. So, you know, the sole survivor last stand, he's given conventional thought that the only survivor of the last stand was Custer. I don't think that's true. Stayed with his master until the end? I don't think that's true either, given the melee of that battle. His first wounding? Not far from here, you know, in the great state. You know, he belongs, he belongs as a Kansas resource near Fort Dodge, Kansas. And he, again, he wasn't in active service very long. Consider he was picked up by Keith, rather by Custer Tom in 1868. And by the middle of September, he's already been wounded in combat. And did Comanches wound Comanches? I would tell you half the time, I don't think they knew who they were fighting. The Comanches were aligned with the Kiowas. And I don't think they had any prisons. I think it was a skirmish that there was no real de definition of who are we actually fighting. But Again, may have been Comanches, but I wouldn't take that to the bank. Again, that suggested reading Empire of the Summer Moon. We'll talk a lot about you know, that period of warfare. The 1876 expedition, okay, it's about time we get into these edicts. So the United States government it issued an edict that got poorly disseminated in December of 1877. And it said, those Indians who marched back on the reservations by January 25th or so, the next month, will consider you to be hostile. So you've been out in western Kansas in the winter, right? You're not going to be doing a lot of moving. And I would say the capitulation interest of the Indians back then was, hey, yeah, make, make us. You know, make, make us. Custer's elements arrived at the Little Bighorn after a 450 mile march on the 25th of June. They weren't supposed to attack until we got these other elements of Terry, Gibbon, and Crook coming from the south. Crook had already been defeated by the same Sioux that were in this village. He, he chose to advance to the rear. Discretion all stuff, better part of value, valor. But Custer got there so fast because he was unencumbered. He'd been offered to take gathering guns, but he knew taking these guns, you're gonna move at the slowest pace and those horse-drawn and mule-drawn guns, so he opted not to. He also opted to leave his sabers back at the Powder River Depot on the way out here. Now, would have sabers done you any good? Well, maybe you could have, you know, maybe you could have had that advance, at least got to the Indian village and had, you know, if you could turn the route, and maybe had Custer been able to cross at Medicine Tail Coulee and capture women and children as he did in the Washington, almost an exact 
mimicking of the battle at the Washita in 1867. The difference being the Washita was conducted in November and they had below zero temperatures. The ardor to fight hard you know, for anybody when it's below zero is pretty limited. He also was successful in taking a goodly number of Indian female squaw children captives which kept at bay these huge number of Indians just a bit down, down the stream from the Washita River. Little Bighorn Battle, they've been talking about this forever. We know that Reno, Reno tried to go this way. He stopped 300 yards up in front of the village and went on the defense. And what happens if you go on the defense? Well, you lose a quarter of your combat power because one cavalry soldier has got to hold four horses. So you lost, you know, one cavalry trying to hold four horses and trying to hold those four horses was the challenge. Custer went around. Benteen, Benteen was around here somewhere. He joined the fight late. He joined Reno when Reno was in defense on the hills over the Little Bighorn River. And that was basically the end of the, end of the engagement. Popular myth. Was he the only survivor? I'd say I, I think not. But he was certainly the only horse evacuated with 52 men from Reno's element aboard the steamer Far West. Now, where was the Far West? The Far West was down the Little Bighorn at the confluence of that stream and the Bighorn. And that place where they found Comanche to that particular spot was 15 miles. So I'll tell you what, they got that horse to that steamer and they got the wounded men from Reno's element to that steamer, but it took them a long time. That steamer did not make its trip back down the Yellowstone, back down to Missouri to Fort Abraham Lincoln, until something like July 3rd. So it took him an awful long time. Many accounts say Custer, rather Comanche, was given a bed on the front of that steamer. Yet I've read another account that says, nah, he was taken at some point later. I believe the fact that he was taken with elements of 52 wounded men, just because of the benefit given his service, who he belonged to, how he had performed before in battle. Shot or arrowed, four or six times, well, perhaps, all depends who is counting, and is an exit wound or an entry wound, an exit wound, the same wound, you're gonna count it twice. We know when he was later done the taxidermy, Professor Dyke at Kansas University determined he'd been shot or error a dozen times, and that was actually examining at close quarter, his, his hide. Was he in a suspension sling? I've read this, I don't think so. If he could make it all the way, you know, 15 miles to the steamer, I would say he was wounded, but he wasn't, you know, mortally wounded, certainly not. Why was he not taken? The myth, the little soldier. He says, there he was. There was Keo holding on to the horse with the reins, Keo being dead. I don't think so. I, I think that horse would have pulled away from, you know, the devil himself to move farther away from that. We know he was shot up and disabled. We know there were one heck of a lot, perhaps, of the 220 or so horses ridden by cavalrymen. Had to be a good number of those that were not wounded. Were they going to mess with a horse? Indians going to mess with a horse and been shot and wounded five or six times? I don't think so. I think it's just something made up a story. That sounds good. We'll, we'll, we'll say that. The steamer far west, Grant Marsh, when he finally got rolling along those rivers, the Bighorn to the Yellowstone to the Missouri to Fort Abraham Lincoln, he covered that 750 miles in something like 56 hours. It's never been exceeded. So he didn't waste any time with that paddle wheel steamer getting down those rivers to get to Fort Abraham Lincoln. He gets back, he's brought back to health. And the general order is published by the post that he never be ridden again. And best we can tell, he wasn't. There's a bit of irony. Did the 7th Cavalry, when they were sent to Wounded Knee, did they expect pitch combat, which would become, quote, the master of Wounded Knee? I don't think so. I don't think they would have taken a ceremonial horse to Wounded Knee and all the logistical support that entailed. But we know Comanche <coughs> was there. And I'd also tell you, yes, it was an awful thing that happened. It got out of control. Women and children were killed. But there was also 41 or better cavalrymen killed at Wounded Knee. And you don't tend to hear that very often in terms of massacres of, of Indians. End of life, certainly given special privilege. Paraded in black each June 25th before 
the regiment ceremoniously, cavalry order, never going to be ridden again, and then unfettered access to the entire installation, typically wherever he was. I'm sure there's some exceptions to that, but typically unfettered access. And many times during formations, company battalion formations, he would trot up and take his position or keel the event. Passed on 7 November 1891. There's a pretty cool video when the Comanche Briar Horsters came out. Very well done video that doesn't attack anybody's sensitivities and they had a great cast and it dealt with Comanche service in his passing. Let's see, Buck Taylor. Remember, remember Matt Dillon? Buck was one of his cohorts. Gerald McRaney was one of the principals. I think he was the commander of the, the 7th Cavalry. Angie Dickinson was in that. Chris Christopherson was in that, and Wilfred Brim. If you ever get a chance to find that, interesting to watch. It's, it's not terribly accurate, but it's not a terrible aberration. On some cavalry, got a hold of Professor Dyke at KU. The name of these cavalry long since passed the history. But they hired Professor Dyke shortly after Comanche's death to have a taxidermy made. Professor Dyke came up by rail from Kansas University, Lawrence took the parts he needed, which you can see were major bones, heads, etc. And the rest of Comanche was interred with full military honors at Fort Riley. A friend of mine, uh, Don Jack, I think he used to be a director of transportation in Kansas, if you're from Kansas, also retired two-star in the Kansas National Guard, says he can remember back in about 70, there being a plaque that says here was interred Comanche, what was left of them that didn't go to KU, with full military honors since been lost. Last, last time I was where Don Jack, I thought it was, it was a parking lot. So, first time I got here, I went to visit Comanche KU Center, Front Mountain Center in the Dyke Museum in Lawrence. Last time I was there three years ago, he was in a cat rack, hat rack area to the left, okay? So the historical relativity or relevance of Comanche kind of comes and goes depending on the political winds. The World's Columbia Exhibition. He did go there. Thank you. This was one hell of an expo in Chicago in 1893. I mean, the scale of this, unbelievable. <coughs> For example, these things that they built just temporarily, this Ferris wheel, they're really thinking of hiring Mr. Eiffel of the Alfred Tower in Paris, but they came up with this thing instead. 100 meters tall, you know, so 300 feet tall, and of those uh, 60 gondolas, they can hold 36 people apiece. Of course, when the exposition went over in a couple of months, you know, that went the way of the bison as well. Tickets for the, you know. And where was the Kansas display where Comanche was? It was over here. Not exactly center of mass. And you say, what's the scale of this? Well, these grounds covered a little short of 700 acres. And I remember a square mile is what, about 620 acres? So it's roughly a mile by a mile. And well, well, well attended. I mean, just millions of people over that short period of time attended this. Canvas Pavilion. Dykes taxidermies, many of which have been destroyed by fire and neglect. The Comanche's still hanging in at KU. So how do you end up there permanently? Okay, here's a quiz. Which one is the correct answer? <laughs> what do you think? I think, it's I think the third one. one, nobody had this in writing, and I know, okay, we're going to let him go to the World's Fair, and you will forgive your $400 bill, Professor Dyke. I think it comes down to here. And I'm glad he ended up at KU, because I think the Army would have lost him. Just like they lost the place where the rest of him was interred at Fort Riley. Yeah. So good thing that it did go there. Now the years moved on. They already wanted to get back that horse. This guy, John Wainwright, senior POW in World War II, Medal of Honor winner. Put in for the Medal of Honor, his boss, MacArthur, who left them behind in the Philippines, recommended disapproval. Want to know what kind of guy he was in the Custer Gilk, General MacArthur. Wainwright got his Medal of Honor and tried like crazy to get that horse back. Here's a picture of Lieutenant Colonel John Wainwright. If you visit Fort Leavenworth, this is Grand Ave. To the left are Buffalo Soldiers, 10th Cav, right across the street, coincidentally, from the Buffalo Soldier Monument that is there now in the clock tower. For perspective, 
I took this picture in the spring of last year. You can see the clock tower. It's over there. But not much has changed. So if, if Wayne Wright couldn't get him back, he's going to be at KU forever. And was he a great horse? I don't know of any more, if horses can be valorous, I don't know of anything that can exceed this horse's way of going. I mean, the first time you hurt a horse or a horse got hurt or something, then you get a little reluctant to move forward. Never had that problem with Comanche. Keogh had choices, he had at least one other horse. He chose to ride Comanche, not Patty. And again, a great amount of history involving Native Americans, United States Cavalry, Miles Keogh, and a great horse that is still part of a great state and a great heritage and a great historical being, Comanche War Horse. What are your questions? Now, if anybody has any questions or comments and say, what? Give me an email. In fact, if any one of you wants a tour of Fort Leavenworth, where truly I find the West began, give me a holler, I'll give you a tour. And I like visiting the four graves of the company commanders yet. And then there's a parking lot right across from what used to be the old army prison where Custer was court-martialed in 1867 and booted out for only a year. If we put him booted out permanently, we probably wouldn't be having this presentation. Some good books, but here's another one. This one, pretty credible book, printed by the Department of the I Interior at the Custer Battlefield National Monument, now since called the Little Bighorn National Monument. A lot of stuff in this stuff isn't exactly factual, and this was published by the U.S. government. Thank you very much for your attention, and have I been long-winded? Not perfect. Nope. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I've got a couple, we put a couple of things in a hat. I need 